Bonjour, Daryl Indishnikas, Caldwell First Nation and Donjaba, Makanak and Dodem. My name is Daryl Van Orskot, I'm from Caldwell First Nation and I'm of the Turtle Clan. Welcome to our territory and thank you for joining us today. We always start with a smudge when we do our events like this and it's in order for us to bring those good thoughts in, for us to allow the good thoughts to come into our head, only good thoughts to leave our mouth and only good things to come into our heart. I'll light the smudge now always with a wood match. I've asked Creator to join us in a good way and to bring all the ancestors with us to put us all in a great frame of mind so we can work together toward one good future together. And we always ask the Creator to join us in these things so that we are always working with one mind, one good heart, and working toward one good future. Thank you, Daryl, for starting us off on such a positive note there. Welcome everyone to this celebration of Indigenous culture, a Carousel Youth Conversation. I'm Allison Johnson, President of the Multicultural Council of Windsor and Essex County, Chair of Carousel of the Nation, and your moderator for today. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Carousel of the Nations, I'm going to just take a minute to mention, it is a celebration of culture and tradition that takes place during the last two weeks of June every year in Windsor, Essex. So during Carousel, ethnic villages are set up across Windsor, Essex at community halls and event centers. And the community has the opportunity, everyone is invited into these villages to check out the different cultures, experience the different cultures, see some entertainment and sample the food. Now, two years ago, Caldwell First Nation took part in this event for the first time. Their members set up a village at their community hall out in Leamington, and they welcomed everyone to stop by and visit. Before the doors opened on day one, there was a lineup to get in. And within minutes of opening, the space was packed. And by early afternoon, the kitchen had sold out of food. So clearly there was an appetite for more, and I'm not just talking about the food here. We did hear from everyone in attendance that they were truly appreciative of this opportunity to connect with members of the Caldwell First Nation community and to learn. And now for safety reasons, we have not been able to celebrate Carousel in its traditional form since that time. But today as part of Carousel 2021 and to celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day, members of the Caldwell First Nation have very generously invited us back into their space albeit virtually this time, for another opportunity to connect and to learn. And the best part of this conversation is that it's youth driven. We have representatives from 13 different youth carousel villages, including the Caldwell First Nation on this call today. And everyone will have the opportunity to participate and to ask questions throughout the conversation. Sound good to everyone? Maybe a thumbs up, perfect. Before we begin, it is important to acknowledge that the Indigenous people are the traditional stewards of the land and the water where each of us are seated today for this virtual call. And we want to acknowledge that the land on which we are gathering is the traditional territory of the Caldwell First Nation, a member of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, and of the Huron, Wendat, and Wyandot peoples. And we recognize that the land as an expression of gratitude to those whose traditional territory we reside on, and as a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and thriving on the land since time immemorial. 
We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island. So let's bring our hosts into this conversation now. And now I want to officially introduce everyone to Daryl Van Orscott. Daryl is responsible for education and cultural experience delivery for the First Nation Caldwell community. Hi, Daryl. Bonjour, Daryl Indigenous Caldwell First Nation and Donjaba Makanakandao. Uh, that's in my language. I'm just telling you, uh, my name is Daryl. I'm from Caldwell First Nation and I'm part of the Turtle Clan. Uh, welcome. We're so glad to be part of this conversation. We really appreciate that uh, so many of you have come. We live in a great multicultural community and it's great to see us all coming together for one talk. It's great. Thanks, Daryl. And now let's uh, invite everyone to say hello to Kelly Alexander. Um, she is the Experience Development and Event Coordinator for the Caldwell First Nation, and she's going to be leading the conversation today in the chat section. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Allison, and hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's so nice to see so many youthful faces on the call. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box today so you can find the chat on the bottom right hand side of your screen. So please feel free to put your questions and comments there and we'll be sure to get to them today. Um, in the meantime, if you can all say hello in the chat box in your own language if you know it, or just a hi in English is great too. Um, and we can get started. So miigwech, thank you. Thank you. And now we do wanna learn a bit more about everyone else seated at the table today. Each youth representative will have an opportunity to tell us who you are, which village you represent, and then one thing that you like to do in your spare time. I'm going to start by introducing the first representative, and then I'm going to ask each of you to call on the next member of the group to introduce themselves. So hopefully that makes sense, um, and it is now my pleasure to invite Anella Oris to begin. Anella? Hi everyone, um, Anella Indishnikaz, Caldwell First Nation in Donshiba. That means in my language, my name is Anella and I am from Caldwell First Nation. I am 16 years old and I'm on the Youth Advisory Committee for Caldwell First Nation, along with two other youth from the nation who unfortunately could not be here today. And in my spare time, I like to listen to music on my record player. And um, the next uh, youth representative is from the Caribbean community. Thank you, Anella. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Monroe Dubois, and I am representing the Caribbean Village. And something I like to do in my spare time is dance. I am now passing it off to the youth representative of the Croatian Committee of Croatian Village. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Carter Rodman. I represent the uh, Croatian Village, and something I enjoy doing on my spare time is just working out. So uh, I'm going to pass the torch to the uh, representative of the Filipino Village. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I'm Alyssa. Hi, I'm Yvonne. Uh, I'm a representative of the Filipino community, and I'm new. Uh, something I like to do in my spare time is uh, I like music, anything to do with music. I'm going to pass it to the representative of, the, of German. Hi, my name is Ali Ryan. I'm the representative of the German village. Something I like to do in my spare time is play soccer, and I will be now passing it on to the Hungarian village. Hi, my name is Zina. I'm representing the Hungarian village. Um, I love gardening in my spare time, and I'll now pass it on to the Indian village. Hi, everyone. My name is Sahana Kalagundi, and I'm the representative for the Indian village. And something I like to do in my free time is go swimming and I'm gonna be passing it on to the Italian village. Hello everyone, my name is Charlotte Savoni and I'm the representative for the Italian village. And in my spare time, I enjoy to bake and cook. I will now be passing it on to the youth representative from the Lebanese village. Hi everybody, I am Ryan Hermes and I am representative from the Lebanese village. I love listening to music and I want to pass it off to the representative of the Mex Mexican village. Hi everyone, my name is Mariana Noriega. Uh, I am representing the Mexican village today and something I like to do in my spare time is draw and paint. And I'm gonna pass it off to the representative from the Polish village. 
Hi everyone, my name is David Makarczyk. I am representing the Polish village. And in my free time, I like to play chess. So I am the last youth representative. So I would like to pass it back to Miss Allison. Thank you so much. And it is a pleasure to meet all of you on the call today. Look forward to hearing from each and every one of you throughout today's conversation. Before we move forward though, um, in order to set the stage for this conversation, Daryl and Anella have generously offered to do a short presentation, give us a bit of context about the Caldwell First Nation in our community, history, uh, some of the traditions. And Daryl, I will hand the mic over to you to begin that conversation. Uh, thank you, Allison. Um, miigwech. Uh, that's how we say thank you in our language. Uh, so um, my job at Caldwell First Nation is uh, I'm lucky enough to get to work with the Youth Advisory Committee, but I also uh, am responsible for cultural and education experience delivery. So I'm lucky enough to be asked to go to schools um, um, pre-COVID, obviously in person. Uh, since COVID, we've been doing a lot of Zoom like this, uh, but it's about education and it's about creating these connections where we actually get to tell people about who we are. And, you know, a lot of people didn't know we were here for a long time. So we, we now have our land base here at home after 230 years of, of fighting to get that home back. We now have uh, our reserve status and we are really excited that we're right here in the heart of Windsor, Essex. Uh, we're in such a multicultural community. It's such a great part of where we live and we want to be part of this community and, and continue this for uh, hopefully I'd like to see this eventually, you know, find out that my uh, great, great, great nieces and nephews are, are still celebrating carousel and still doing these talks with the youth. I'd love to know that happens. So um, thank you for having us here. And I just quick, a uh, little bit about us is uh, Point Pelee and Pelee Island are the heart of our ancestral territory. So we have been here uh, documented on paper since the 1700s, uh, but through archeological digs and archeological uh, evidence, we are learning more and more from these things. They've become our teachers. And we can now trace ourselves back more than 13,000 years here. So uh, this has been our home forever. And it's nice to continue to be able to call this home. Um, during the War of 1812, we allied with the British. And that's where we actually got our name Caldwell. Uh, we uh, fought alongside of William Caldwell, a British soldier. And uh, our, uh, our one of our war chiefs, Tecumseh, he, um, a very famous war chief, he had immense respect for Brock and that respect continued down to Caldwell. Eventually we started being called Caldwell's Band of Indians. And as those years passed, we took the name Caldwell First Nation, um, partially as uh, in recognition. Uh, so the British honored those promises and those things to us. Uh, we, we kept that name. So um, Caldwell is still our name. We are the possibility of, of looking at uh, creating our name in our language as well. So those are things we're looking forward to. Uh, we've got a lot of development happening in the area. Uh, uh, we're in the middle of developing the largest indigenous restaurant in the world, which will be here uh, in the Leamington area. So uh, we, we have a lot of exciting things coming and we're just really happy to be here and part of this conversation. So thank you for letting me just tell you a little bit about our history. And I'm going to maybe hand it on to Anella now so she can talk a little bit about uh, what they're up to. Um, yeah, I, as I said before, I'm on the Youth Advisory Committee for Caldwell. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why culture is important to us and a few of the initiatives that the Youth Advisory Committee has taken. But before I do that, I um, do want to acknowledge um, that recently there was a discovery of the, two, of the bodies of 215 Indigenous children at what used to be the Kamloops Residential School in an unmarked mass grave. Every one of these children were stolen from their families, communities, and homes that love them. They are victims of genocidal violence, which the Canadian residential school system inflicted upon the lives of in innocent Indigenous children and their families. As a result of this discovery, the Youth Advisory Committee for Caldwell First Nation has put forward a motion to the Associ Association of Iroquois and Allied Indians uh, to have ground penetrating radar used at all places where residential schools are or used to be. Um, at Caldwell, we are holding a sacred fire that anyone is welcome to attend until June 17th, which honors the lives and spirits of the children 
and we can now show you a video that explains some of what is happening at the fire. Caldwell First Nation in Nunjaba. Um, so today is day 11 of the sacred fire. Um, Caldwell is doing the uh, sacred fire for the children that were found in BC. Um, so this is a um, part of a ceremony. Um, so we cannot put that on film. Um, but I will tell you a little bit about the process when people do come to the sacred fire. So we have our asama, uh, tobacco, and we have gijik, cedar. So when you come to the fire, you'll take some tobacco, and you'll put it in your left hand, because your left hand is the closest to your heart. And you'll just put your um, thoughts and messages, um, anything that you would like, you put that in that tobacco, and then you put that in the fire. And then um, gijik, uh, the cedar goes in the fire, and it's that crackling noise of the cedar and the fire that lets creator know that messages are coming. And then that smoke takes those messages that you've put in that fire up to creator. Um, yeah, so in that video, uh, Carrie Ann Peters, who uh, works at the Caldwell Band Office, explained a little bit um, about what the importance of the sacred fire is. And um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about why culture is important to Caldwell First Nation. So first of all, it keeps our traditions alive. And um, it's also important to respect and acknowledge our ancestors through the traditions because our culture um, has been, um, there have been attempts to destroy and eliminate our, cul our culture through genocide and colonization. And we wanna revitalize it and make sure that it can stay here for the next seven generations. Um, some of the initiatives that the Youth Advisory Committee has worked on, um, as a committee, we have started working on getting personhood status for Lake Erie. Uh, this would mean Lake Erie possesses personal autonomy and would be recognized as a living entity. Um, in other words, Lake Erie will be granted the rights of a human being. Um, by doing this, we are acknowledging and acting on our inherent role to maintain the well-being of the water. Um, another initiative that the Youth Advisory Committee has taken is promoting environmental stewardship through social media. Um, we've used hashtags like skip the plastic, save the planet, save mother earth, and my future, our future. Um, we want people to start making decisions consciously about what affects the environment positively and negatively and how to, and how to reduce the negative impacts. Um, this includes things like recycling, using reusable water bottles and straws, um, not littering, picking up litter when you see it, and re reducing your carbon footprint, so ordering locally instead of internationally. Um, another uh, initiative is um, we put forward a resolution to the Chiefs of Ontario um, to take down statues in Canada that honor um, historical oppressors of Indigenous peoples. Um, the, it stated the use of street names, monuments, natural spaces, and public buildings that bear um, the names of historical oppressors of Indigenous peoples and perpetuate the appearance of oppression be replaced with names that reflect the culture and values of Indigenous people. Um, this resolution was passed and we are working on next steps for this. Um, yeah, that's basically we our values and um, what we think is important. And um, we're also uh, working on developing a language app for Colbo First Nation. Um, this would help to revitalize the language and that everyone in the community would have access to the language and um, people would be able to learn um, in a different ways than um, in a classroom because to us, a classroom is not a traditional way of learning. And we want to um, include um, different learning styles so everyone is comfortable in the way that they learn the language. And um, yeah, so I can pass it back to Allison. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all that with us, Anella. It sounds like as a member of the youth committee, you and your team are very, 
very busy uh, with all those wonderful initiatives. Um, in just a minute, we're going to open up the floor to questions uh, from our Carousel Village representatives. Daryl, before we move on, um, at the top, you did a smudge um, that really started out uh, us all in this conversation on a really positive note, good vibes. I could kind of almost smell um, when you were doing that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and the significance of the smudge? Absolutely. Um, so I would have to say first, smudge has become a term for it that we all use. Uh, but in our language, there is no word for smudge. Uh, the closest we have would translate to the burning of medicines. So um, because our language is so descriptive, one word is a sentence often or more than a sentence. It's very difficult to translate those things. So I just wanted to kind of mention that it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to take our language and make it Canadian or, or English as we I call it now. Um, so just to, to make that connection for you to so understand that um, when we burn our medicines, uh, every medicine, our four main medicines, I guess I should say first, are tobacco, sage, cedar, and sweetgrass. Um, obviously many more medicines come into play as well, but those are our four main ones that are, um, they have spiritual powers that we we rely on. So our tobacco, as Carrie Ann mentioned, when you burn tobacco, the burning of tobacco brings you can put your thoughts, your prayers, your hopes. And when you put that tobacco in the fire, the smoke from that takes those thoughts and prayers up to the creator. So in my smudge, I put a very small amount of a tobacco to be able to take those thoughts to the creator. And then I used sage. And the reason I use sage is sage is a cleansing um, medicine. So it clears out negativity. It takes away uh, unnecessary um, attachments from us. So, you know, when you've got, uh, a, you've had a long day and you feel your shoulders are just, they're sagging because you've had so much on them. Burning of that sage and, and bringing that into yourself is a way to lift your shoulders back up and to take that weight off of your shoulders. Um, and then obviously in my thoughts to the creator, I always ask, uh, to put us in the right frame of mind. You know, um, we all have bad days here and there. We all have things going on in our lives, but when we come in together, something, uh, as important as seeing all of you youth, which is you've brought me to tears already once just seeing you all and having you introduce each other. Um, it really means a lot to us to see so many communities coming together. Uh, so that's, uh, to us, that's an immense part of, of who we are as people. We're inclusive. Uh, traditionally, that's what we do is we welcome you. Um, we say, um, Matt Benjina, come sit a while. Uh, so we would welcome you and say, be part of our community. And, and uh, that's part of who we are. So that sage brought and that tobacco brings burning them together brought us to a point where I can say we're all sitting here as one community. Creator, please put us all in a good frame of mind where we only think good things we only speak good things we only allow good things into our heart and we don't allow anything negative to come into our ears um so that's where i always start any of these things where i do with youth because you're already powerful powerful youth uh every one of you has immense power in you and if you keep it in a positive way you guys are going to make this planet much better than we ever could thank you daryl um, and I do want now to turn the floor over to the members of um, our youth represent representatives from Carousel. I'm going to invite each Carousel youth representative to join the conversation. Everyone will have one opportunity to ask a question. Um, we will go in the same order as we did with the introduction at the beginning, but please, um, you have one opportunity to ask questions. If you have further questions, please put them in the chat box and Kaylee will make sure that they are included in this conversation. Even if you just have any thoughts along the way, please feel free to share them because that's what today is all about. So let's get started and I will call on the youth representative from the Caribbean village to kick off our conversation. Hello and thank you Daryl for sharing about the smudging that was really interesting. Um, my question is what is the proper way to reference Indigenous people? I often hear Native Canadian, Aboriginal, Native Indian and of course Indigenous. Are any of these terms inappropriate or offensive? Um. I can take this one. Uh, 
Personally, I prefer Indigenous or First Nation. Um, indigenous is an umbrella term to refer to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. So um, it's when you're just talking about First Nations, it's improper to say, um, like if it's specifically something that happened to First Nations and not the Métis or Inuit people, it's um, improper to say Indigenous because then it includes those um, two other groups of people and um, it like gets confused. Um, I think that Indian is an outdated term. Um, First Nations people can and Indigenous people can use it um, together, call themselves that word, but um, having being called um, that by someone who's non-Indigenous, it can be offensive to some people. And Aboriginal, um, I don't like the word, some people still use it. I think that it's outdated um, because the word, the ab part of Aboriginal would mean that they're not original. So it's kind of, it's not conveying what we want to with the term. So I don't use the word Aboriginal when I refer um, to Indigenous peoples, but I, can, I know some people who think that the word is all right and they prefer Aboriginal over Indigenous. So I think it's just um, personal preference, but to be safe, I think Indigenous is proper, Indigenous peoples. Yeah. And they're all that was a great answer, Anella. I'm just going to elaborate a tiny bit on that. Um, so Indian is what we are on our status cards. Um, and this is such an outdated term because it goes back to when Columbus came, uh, Christopher Columbus thought he was actually landing in India. So he thought he found the Indians. Uh, not that there's, you know, obviously multicultural, it's great to be Indian, but it's a false he, he falsely assumed he was in India, clearly finding out that he was in North America eventually, uh, what we've always called Turtle Island. Um, so that's that. And I agree with Anella. I am, I don't like the word Aboriginal for the same reason. Uh, you know, it reminds me of the word abnormal, less than normal. So Aboriginal gives the connotation of less than original. Uh, and we know that our ancestors are the original people. So um, I, I, Really liked Danella's answer. Indigenous does umbrella um, uh, Métis, Inuit, and First Nations people. Uh, myself, I would much rather um, to be called Indigenous or First Nations. That that to me is. But again, she is right. There's people who would prefer you stick to calling them Indian because that's what their card says, or would stick to call them Aboriginal because that was the next term kind of after Indian. So. Um, the fact that you asked the question is very sensitive to the fact that you're going to have different groups of people uh, wish to be addressed differently. Just the fact that you're you're entertaining that question says that your heart is in the right place, and I don't think anyone will be in, insulted, uh, whichever way you choose to speak to them. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, uh, we will go to the rep from the Croatian village. All right, thank you. Uh, my question is just, um, what makes you guys most proud of your uh, like your culture and your uh, community? Being part of this is a huge point of pride for me. Uh, I don't wanna get teary eyed while I'm talking, but our youth are an immense driver for me. When I've had a bad day and I have a meeting that night with the Youth Advisory Committee, I am motivated and reminded of why I do my job the next day. Everything that the youth are doing, the, the world you are creating as youth, and this isn't just our youth, it's all of you across the board. The inclusivity and the uh, the stopping lateral hatred for no reason and the getting rid of, you know, stop seeing people's creed and color and religion as a reason to hate. Your generation is creating a world that the sky's the limit. So these are the things that make me most proud to be in, involved in. Anything our youth are doing, I will happily get involved in. I'm also very proud to say after 230 years, we now have our home back. We have a land to call home. Uh, that's very, very exciting for us. It tells us that for 230 years, uh, and even though there were things done to try to, um, you know, there was cultural genocide committed and there were these terrible things that happened and our people have constantly said, this is our home and we are not leaving and we are going to be here. 
So we have to acknowledge the resilience of our ancestors. And I think that's across the board again, uh, not just our ancestors, but all of ours. You know, this is what it's about, being proud of where you come from and being proud of who you are. So thank you for that question, because uh, these are the things that make me most proud. Um, for me, I, the things that make um, me pr most proud to be Indigenous um, is the traditions and the values. I mean, uh, we believe that um, we don't own the land. That's a colonized um, uh, way of thinking. But uh, so we believe that we steward the land and it's our responsibility to take care of it and to protect it. Um, as well as the waters and the airs. And I, I really appreciate those values and I'm proud that that's a part of my culture and my history. And actually <laughs> my sweater says proud to be, but I'm wearing, I just, I forgot I was wearing that, but yeah. Thank you for the question. I'm actually wearing mine as well, Anella. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, we will go now to the uh, Carousel Youth Representative from the Filipino Village. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, if you were to encapsulate the core beliefs of your culture, like personally for you, and like that was the only thing that you would like share with someone else, I was just wondering, um, like, what that would be. Um, for me, the first thing that I think of is um, the medicine wheel, um, the four directions, and the four medicines. Um, the medicine wheel, it's like also in four places and it represents um, the four stages of life and the four medicines um, Daryl talked about earlier, sage, cedar, tobacco, and sweetgrass, um, and the values and some, um, what smudging means, that's what comes to mind when I think of my culture. Um, maybe Daryl can elaborate. Um, I, you know, I think that's beautiful now. And I think if you ask 20 of us, we'd all have a different answer. Um, and I think that's a beautiful question, Elizabeth. Thank you for it. Um, and I would have to say for me, it's, uh, there's a few things, but right now my head is that um, we have been inclusive always as people. Um, you know, it's finally in this century and we're finally seeing people being treated more equally across the board and we're seeing the acknowledgement of, of uh, you know, different genders and things. As First Nations people, we have always, uh, we call them two-spirit is what we've said uh, for our LGBT, LGBTQ. Um, two-spirit is what we've always called them. And they've made some of our most powerful medicine men and women and they've been, uh, but we have, long known that there are many genders. That's a First Nation, very old tradition that we we don't, A, we have no right, creator gave us no right to judge anyone. So that has been taken from us. So all of those hateful things to judge people for no reason, that's not even our right. Only creators got that right. That's a big one. Um, and I think all of the things around that right now are where my mind is that uh, I would want to push forward because we believe in our deepest tradition that we all tie back to the same original man and woman. That means we're all brothers and sisters. The only thing that separates us is language and we should be able to cross those barriers on our own. So, uh, you know, those old traditions and, and the stewardship of the land and things like that, that are truly old rooted traditions that we need to get back to. And those are the things I would really be trying to teach first. Thank you for the question. Yes, Elizabeth, I really enjoyed that question. Thank you both. Um, next up, we have the youth representative from the German village. Hi, thank you. My question is why is it important in your culture? Sorry, I missed the beginning of your question. Could you ask that again? Why is dancing so important in your culture? Dancing was, uh, Anella, do you want to start or would you like me to start? Uh, you can start. Uh, um, so it's something actually I would like to see brought back at Caldwell because unfortunately it's one of the traditions we have lost. But at, as a general rule, we do um, at events where we're able to be in person, we try to end with what's called a round dance or a friendship dance. 
And this is done in a circle and it's, uh, it widens as the group grows. And it's about, um, again, when you're leaving a group or you're leaving a community, it's about that positivity and that uh, sending good thoughts with each other as you leave. Uh, so we do a friendship dance or we call a round dance and that's, it's a very simple dance, but dancing was such a part of our daily life traditionally. It wasn't just done uh, for ceremony, but it was done, uh, you know, you might do it personally. You're having your smudge alone in the morning. You might have done a dance to honor the sun or to thank the creator for allowing the sun to rise that day. Um, thanking the creator for giving us the medicines and the plants and the species that feed us and allow us to live. Uh, so dance was involved in every aspect. Storytelling included dance. Um, our creation story, if told traditionally, would take three days to tell the story. And that's with ceremony, dance, uh, uh, the storytelling itself, singing, drumming. It's all incorporated into a daily part of our lives that was traditional. So um, it would be nice to bring those things back. But dance was the same as uh, brushing your teeth nowadays. It was just part of your day. It was uh, when you, you were out harvesting, you may have done a pause and there may have been a dance to thank creator for the harvest. It is... It's, uh, and I, I want to say it was Gabby who said she loves to dance. It was part of who we are and it was in our heart. And I think Gabby, as a dancer, you'd be able to say you, you probably dance when you don't even know you're dancing. So um, it's a cultural aspect that just was part of our lives. Um, yeah, like Daryl said, Caldwell has uh, lost that part of our history. Um, so I don't know much about uh, the dance part, but I think that Daryl did a really good job of explaining it. So thank you for the question, Holly. And I do want I just to want, oh, sorry, sorry. Alex. I ahead. just wanted to add to that. Um, hopefully this summer they'll be happening live again or starting to, but there is a powwow circuit that does, uh, most nations do have a powwow. Um, likely Caldwell will again one day, we'll be working toward that once we have dancers and singers and we can actually be part of it. Um, but there are many local First Nations from even from here to London, you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different powwows that go on throughout the summer. So uh, if you're out and um, actually we can put that link on, it's called powwow.com and you can look at their calendar and they can show you uh, where you're at, where you live and what powwows are local and what days those are at. And even if you're only able to go for an hour, uh, you can see some of the amazing vendors and crafters they have, but also there's dance demonstrations from, most of them have them all day long. They're traditional dances. They require an unbelievable amount of stamina, especially in the heat with all of the regalia on. So I, I do recommend if you have a chance to go, go check that out. And we will put that link in the chat section and also on our uh, Facebook post so that everyone can check that out. And I do want to draw everyone's attention to uh, one of the comments from Kaylee in the chat section today. Uh, Kaylee says, we can't wait until COVID allows us all to meet in person and we can do a friendship round dance together. Uh, that sounds amazing. I would uh, love to be in a, in a round dance with each and every one of you at the table today. Um, and now we'll call upon the Carousel Youth Representative from the Hungarian Village uh, to ask the next question. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to know, um, 10 years from now, if we are having this conversation together, what do you hope is different about our world and our community? Um, okay. And now I'm gonna let you start. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, definitely one to think about. I think that if I thought about it all day, it would probably change from what I'm going to say right now. But I think that just to have everyone more um, educated and uh, knowledgeable about what really happened um, in Canada. And um, so everyone understands why um, Indigenous people are so adamant in getting that truth and reconciliation. Um, because right now I know not everyone, but a lot of people are saying like, I won't believe that um, the residential schools are bad like until you prove that the parents didn't drop the kids off there. Like I've seen that and 
comments like that on social media. And it's disappointing because I know that the curriculum in school, um, it's not mandatory to learn about the culture. I know that um, I took a class, um, it's called World Religions. And one of the units was on indigenous spirituality, but it wasn't a mandatory course for people to take. And even then it misses a lot of um, information about uh, what happens in the residential schools and focuses more on like the good part of what happens and um, when yeah so I just hope that people would be more educated um, on what really happened so they can't deny it and then when we get that truth part out then we can finally have the reconciliation and Daryl if you want to add that was beautiful and Ella um, and I, I I mimic your sentiments, but I'm going to say for me, if I said we were having this conversation again in 10 years, um, we have 13 different villages represented here. Is that right, Allison? 12 or 13? Um, so that's 12 different villages, different nationalities coming together to have one talk. Um, without knowing each other with uh, you all come together and, and you're doing this talk which i think is beautiful so if i said in 10 years what i'd like to see is maybe this isn't a once conversation maybe this conversation ends up happening twice a year and you all get together and discuss uh, maybe maybe you become the youth advisory committee for the carousel of nations and you tell us as the older generation how we need to make this uh, carousel different uh, to enhance the experience for your generation or what we can do to pass that torch onto your generation so that Carousel of the Nations is celebrating its 150th anniversary one day, that you guys are carrying that on. And I'll take it one step further. If it's 10 years from now, I would love to be able to say, hey, um, I'll write a letter to the UN and say, we have 130 different nations youth working together as one cohesive unit to make multiculturalism beautiful. You do better. So you guys could be leading the way for what the UN needs to be in the future too. This is, um, I have big dreams for you all. So uh, this conversation could get huge for you. Thanks, Daryl. Next question, um, we'll go to the Carousel Youth Representative for the Indian Village. Hi, Daryl and Anella. Um, I found that weddings are such a huge part of so many different cultures. So I was wondering, what are some rituals and traditions that are done in weddings in your culture? Uh, so traditional weddings are a bit different. We are trying to bring those things back. And a lot of people as they're getting married uh, in our nation are, are bringing those as many traditions as they can, you know, um, going back to things like uh, bringing feathers into that uh, to remind us of that all birds are messengers to the creator. So you bring that those feathers in to give you that reminder of sending those messages to creator, to be thankful, to be loving, to be kind. Uh, all of the things uh, as men uh, in our First Nations traditions, we are meant to learn from our women. So everything good in life, we believe women are born inherently with those things in their heart. And as men, we need to learn them from our women. So um, just hearing that question, actually, you're, you're teaching me something just then. I'm learning something again. So uh, Anella, maybe I'll let you carry on here for a second before I uh, continue and to see what you would say about that. Um, I uh, Do you have any? Have you been to a traditional wedding yet? I didn't know that there was any. I didn't know uh, that weddings in our culture. So. Okay. So I have been to a few on different uh, First Nations uh, for example, um, this past year, two years ago, I'm sorry, my sister actually got married and tried to bring in as much cultural aspects as she could. So she did bring in the feathers and she did bring in the, uh, the colors of the medicine wheel and she did bring in um, uh, the tying of the wrists and, and things like that, which is, uh, which is our symbolism. Uh, a knot is tied, the wrists are bound. Um, now in old tradition, you would have been bound for seven days. So uh, you would have been bound to your husband, wife, or partner for the next seven days by one wrist. And you had those seven days, and this was the one chance you had as a couple. 
if in seven days you decided as a couple to sever that knot, then that wedding never happened. But if in that seven, at the end of seven days, the knot was still tied, you had made that commitment and that was your marriage and that was your decision. So they were given that seven days as close as possible, stuck together to say, this is how close you're going to live for the rest of your life. Uh, make sure you can handle it before you commit. And that was uh, a big part of it. So it was that wrist binding and you'd find it very difficult, especially, I mean, now we have technology and things that help us do everything. But when you had to use your bare hands to light a fire and you only have one free, you learn teamwork very quickly and that each of you has got a responsibility. So um, for us, the wedding itself was a celebration of community. But that tying of the knot was a, a symbolic uh, commitment of, of those two people saying, we're going to give this a shot for seven days. And, and hopefully they made it through those seven days. So I haven't actually seen the knot done for seven days. I've never seen it done. That's an old tradition. But I still see the knot tied um, as they are exchanging their vows. And Ella, does that sound like a tradition uh, that you'd like to see come back? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny to see, but uh, a little intense. <laughs> but thank you for the question. That is really interesting. Thank you. Um, our next question um, right now will come from the Carousel Youth Representative from the Italian Village. Hello. So in light of recent events, is it upsetting or finally reassuring to know that it took many people this long to see the truth behind what many Indigenous individuals and communities have gone through and continue to cope with today? Um, I think that it's both, both upsetting and reassuring um, because it it's stuff that we knew um, and it's upsetting that it happened at all, but it's, I think that it's good that finally the truth is coming out and people um, can't deny this part of Canada's history. And then once all the truth is out there, then the reconciliation can finally be done in Canada. So thank you for the question. That's a good question. Uh, Daryl, if you wanted to add anything. Yes, uh, thank you for that question, Charlotte. Um, I'm I'm blown away by your abilities as young people to come up with these insightful, insightful, and deep questions. It's it again. You're just giving me great hopes for our future. Um, and uh, again, this conversation is a big part of that. Um, I don't. For me, I wasn't shocked by the finding at all. Uh, we've known for a long time that thousands of children were missing and that they never were accounted for and we never knew what, what happened. So not shocked, but reassured for sure, because uh, it's finally confirming what we've known. And again, what Anella said about truth and reconciliation, it, we need to get the entire truth out there. She's right. Because once the truth comes out and we all know what happened and we can actually send those lost children to their families in a culturally appropriate way uh, and put them to rest, then I think we can truly work toward reconciliation, which is what I think you are already doing here in this conversation. So thank you all for being part of this. Uh, Anella, Daryl, as part of the uh, initial presentation, you showed the, the fire uh, celebration that was taking place. What's it been like there um, since that fire started earlier on? What happens there? Uh, well, there has been, um, we've seen a lot of community members come by, uh, not just community members from Caldwell, but uh, you know, people we've, we, who know us, who know where we are in the, in the town, um, even you know, companies we've done business with and uh, funders we've, we've done um, uh, partnerships and things like that with we're receiving all of these solidarity statements and that is beautiful to see. Um, I think again, uh, what Charlotte said, now that it's, it's been put out in the media and it's out there for Canadians to see the, the tragic true story, I think it's gonna be very hard to sweep that back under the rug and we're gonna see some real movement here. And uh, I think once again, that truth is out there. Um, uh, those things, you're watching it now, we're seeing all of these, 
community members come and, and offer tobacco and and stand at the fire. And um, you know, we have had community members call and say their youth group would like to do some baking and bring it to the people at the fire to make sure they have some food. We are seeing things um, again. We're in a we're in a different time, and and the truth is coming out. So. Uh, it's it's really starting to show that we are part of a multicultural community and that we are to, all all are tied together in this. Every life matters. Thank you. Um, I would now like to invite the youth representative from the Lebanese village to ask a question. Thank you for the introduction and all the all the information that you provided. I would like to ask: When was the last time you encountered racism? Myself, um, I can't say uh, I've, I've experienced a lot of racism aimed at myself directly. Uh, as a First Nation in 2015, we did have on, um, we have signs up on, on what is now our first piece of reserve property. And in 2015, um, whether as a bad joke or, or, or for whatever reason, somebody did spray paint white power and uh, some other racist slurs uh, on our signs that said the proud home of Caldwell First Nation. So that was very disheartening in such a multicultural community. But again, the actions of one should not condemn the actions of everyone else. You can't, you know what I mean? It's, uh, we hope it was just one individual and right away we had again, such pouring of, of support from the town and from the area that one of the companies locally came to the nation and replaced all of those signs at no cost. He, he donated his time and his product to make sure they were replaced and that that racist hate speech was just not allowed to stay. So it's unfortunate. We are living in the 21st century, but it's unfortunate, but hate breeds hate. So, you know, when you when you foster hate in your home, you're going to foster that in your children. And I think, again, you guys all being part of this conversation, we are in a multicultural community. We are in a multicultural country. And uh, it, it's time to end these, these ridiculous hatred for no reason. Um, so to me, this, uh, with you, 12, 13 of you that are here, this is a big step forward. And we try to look at the positives rather than focus on those negatives and allow them to ruin all the good that's coming. Thank you for that question, Ryan. Um, for me, I don't know if I've ever um, experienced racism like exactly. I think I've definitely experienced ignorance um, The and which is like kind of the same, but different because you can't blame people if it's like embedded in their mentality, like if that's what they've been taught, it's hard to like just educate them on the spot. Um, but I don't look what look like what a typical native person might look like or what people think native people look like. I have light skin. So I know that when people do learn that I'm indigenous, um, they kind of get uncomfortable or they say things or they stop saying things that they were saying when I was around because now they know that I'm indigenous. Um, I'd say the most recent time, um, I'd, I don't think it was racism, but cultural appropriation and ignorance. Um, when I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, um, I was in the world religions class and my teacher asked um, everyone to pick a spirit animal while she was teaching about indigenous culture. So it's like, uh, and she also asked people to make a totem pole with their favorite color, favorite animal and favorite sport. And it's just like the ignorance that she wasn't explaining the significance of a totem pole or like that not all nations um, use that. And um, yeah, it's, it's disappointing that it was being taught in a school. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you for sharing that, Anella. Um, the next question is from the Carousel Youth Representative from the Mexican Village. Um, hi, um, all I wanted to ask is if you had to pick one thing to teach the public about Indigenous peoples in Canada today, what would it be and why? Uh, Daryl, do you want to start? <laughs> 
uh, you know, I, I thought of a few things about that. Um, if I was going to, if I wasn't speaking in it to youth, I'd have a different answer. But because I'm speaking to sh such a young group who are already um, open-minded and and inclusive thinking and forward thinking, and um, my my answer would be different. And I would say um, we did not choose to be pushed into our reserves and kept to ourselves. That was done to us. And that uh, our youth, especially in Nella and our, our youth uh, advisory committee are, are really pushing toward being inclusive and being part of a community and, and being proud to be who we are because, um, you know, our people have been victimized terribly, but we are very strong, proud people. We do not need to live as victims. We don't need to allow ourselves to be victimized anymore. So, I think being part of a community and, and, and standing up and being proud of who we are. Um, we were talking about the residential schools there. And, you know, one of the unfortunate things about residential schools is they promoted self-hatred and shame about being Native, uh, about being First Nation. Um, in fact, one of the mandates of the school was to kill the Indian in the child. That's heartbreaking to hear those words. It, it is. But it's also... Um, I'm trying to think of the right wording. It it just tells you the strength and resilience of of our people, and that we we continue to thrive, and we continue to want to celebrate and be proud of who we are, while being part of this beautiful multicultural country. So uh, I think that would be for me that we are part of it. We are not separate entirely, though we are considered sovereign nations. We are still part of this country and want to be considered such. Wonderful. Thank you. Anella, did you have something to add? Sorry. Um, for me, I don't know if I could pick one thing. It's very hard to pick one thing because um, I would say the history of what's happened to them is important, but um, it's also important to say like their values and um, what was happening before um, contact. Um, I'd say the history, because I think that um, it helps people understand um, why we want truth and reconciliation and we're not greedy and not like we can't get over something that is actually genocide that um, happened. And because a lot of people don't see it that way and they use like terms like ethnic cleansing that instead of saying genocide, which has like, they have, um, yeah, I think genocide is a more powerful word. And when people say like, try to whitewash it or sugarcoat it, um, it's disappointing. So I would say definitely teaching the history would be one thing. Well I said, Anella. And I'm just gonna add so that uh, for a little context to what Anella said about pre-contact, uh, just just to throw a little statistic out there so your understanding of what, what uh, I think would help clarify what you're saying, Anella. Um, you know, before Columbus came, um, the First Nations had 100% use and access to the resources of North America. In 2021, all of the 660 First Nations in Canada take up less than 1% of the land in Canada. That means 99% of our home was taken from us. And, and that's, I mean, you know, if somebody came and said, you can have 1% of your house, we're taking the rest. That, you know, it would it would affect everyone. So it's just to, to make that statistic clear, it's quite a, a jarring change. And it's actually much less than 1%. I think it's 0.26%. But it is, it's sad that we've, we've gone from that. So just to put that in context, there's a statistic that, that many people don't know. So. I see a I see a question from the Slovak village here that says, uh, "What can we do to make up for the past?" Um, this is a big step. Look what we're doing. We're talking about this. We're having an open chat about, you know, what is a terrible part of our past, but is also helping us as a First Nation at Caldwell. Uh, remember why we celebrate culture and why we're so proud of who we are. You know, um, yes, Anella's right. There was cultural genocide that tried to be committed, but we're still here and we are proud to be here and we're proud to be who we are. So 
uh, bringing back those cultural traditions and uh, and things and being allowed to do that and being given the opportunity to talk like this is a big step toward that reconciliation. Uh, I think as youth, you are making the steps that unfortunately this country has not made. Um, also, I'd say I encourage everyone to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 96 calls to action. Those um, have an outline for everything that, just about everything that Indigenous people are asking for. And I think only eight or 10 of them have been completed. And um, they were, I think they were put out in 2015. And uh, they're, if they keep going at the rate that they're going at, um, because I think that one was completed and then they undid that. So if they keep going at that rate, I think they'll be done in like 2086. So if you read them and you push for them and uh, you just, yeah, I educate on, on the calls to action and also reading UNDRIP um, would help too, so. You just yeah. read my mind, sweetie. So uh, the calls to action came from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And they were created based on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, so this is uh, the UN who, you know, did the, the UNDRIP. And based on that, when movement had been slow in 2015, the calls to action at the commission were put forward. And we're, you know, 20 to 15 to now, uh, nine, and actually you're right, and now I believe one got undone, so it's probably eight again have been completed. And that means realistically, that's less than 8% of Canada's responsibilities to indigenous peoples has been fulfilled or has been followed through with. So, uh, you know, what, Anella, that's a very good answer. I've, again, you, the youth, uh, ours and all of you in this, in this meeting are just your ability to uh, think through things and the way you're all um, com coming up with your question. I'm, I'm very impressed with all of you. I'm very, very humbled to be a part of this day. I'm going to put uh, Kaylee on the spot here. I'm not sure if she has access to um, right now, if we could pop into the chat section, those calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation that you recommended uh, reading. And if not, we can absolutely send them out in an email after and include them uh, as a link in the post uh, when this is... Uh, placed on social media. One last question for the day and the final question of the day from our Carousel Youth Representatives. And this one goes to the Polish village. Hello, so my question would be, what is the significance of the peace pipe to indigenous culture? Because I know that often in books or movies, we hear about this as like a very important element. So could you explain further the significance of it to your culture? Yes, so uh, a peace pipe is not, um, for us, it's not as um, prevalent. We do use a peace pipe. It has been used by the Ojibwe Anishinaabe. Uh, but for many nations, a peace pipe is uh, is part of uh, any time you make a, what we call treaties. Uh, you're making a, um, I don't want to say a deal because that's not the word. Uh, we would call it a partnership or, or a, a pact because our belief in treaties was that we always, it was 50-50, it was give and take. It was never one side got more than the other. They were um, equal. And, you know, we didn't have signatures back then. It was when you smoked that peace pipe, you were making that agreement together and the smoke, you didn't inhale the smoke um, like you do today, obviously, when they're smoking a cigarette or a pipe. But the smoke from a, a peace pipe, you don't inhale. What you're doing is burning that tobacco and sending the thoughts from that treaty, from that discussion to the creator. So the creator has witnessed the, uh, the pact that you are making. So uh, that would be the significance. It's, it's, it's part of that pact with, uh, with the creator involving him in that. Okay, thank you. That's very insightful. Thank you uh, for the question. Thank you all. Uh, for those questions. The, there were some amazing and very insightful questions in there. And I think Daryl definitely agrees with me. Um, lots of opportunity to talk about uh, many different things. So thank you all for, for coming and for putting so much thought into that. Your villages um, all must be so proud of all of you. Um, just this chat 
gives me great hope and uh, makes me so happy to have been part of it. I'm so happy Anella was able to give us her time and be part of this as well. And again, just to say thank you to the carousel for giving us this opportunity to talk to you at all, to all of you. And, and thank you, Daryl. And uh, great hopes for the future. You keep uh, talking about that. So before we do sign off for today, um, I know you did talk about at the beginning too that this is just the beginning um, of everyone working together. Uh, one good future together, how you described it off the top. What does that look like? And assuming this is just the beginning, what is next? And uh, Anella, I'm going to steal your words. I don't know if you said them today in this meeting, but I know you said them um, earlier today in, in our pre-meeting. Uh, she used the word um, embracing. And I think that's a big part of what uh, changes this generation's uh, mindset from ours. So uh, you embrace the similarities between each other as as humans and it doesn't matter what country or creed it, it shouldn't matter you embrace those similarities and you don't focus on those things that make you different you're not uh i don't, I don't know how to put it other than that your anella said it better i think but i think anella said uniting as one race as human beings was was what she how she worded it and it really made me uh, happy to hear those words coming out of her mouth because that's exactly what I uh, I think the world needs to see happen. We stop focusing on those small differences and start looking at what makes us all the same. You know, we are all humans. We're all we're all here for love and for family and to be part of a great world. So why not create that world together? I think that that was definitely a theme throughout the day. Um, we started off asking everyone to just share one thing um, that they like to do. And, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. People like to get out. They like to listen to music. They like to dance, right? I agree 100% with what you're saying. Um, pride in culture, that connects us all. Pride in who we are as Canadians um, in the community and the struggles and and working together, uh, the environment, uh, a topic that came up that I think everyone can connect with and stand behind. So thank you all for being part of this conversation. I do want to give uh, the last word to Anella, uh, if you want to share your thoughts on today, or if you have anything else that you want to add uh, before we bring this to a close. Um, just echoing what Daryl said, um, embracing the similarities, um, but also acknowledging the differences and not seeing them as negative things. Um, yeah, and I, I think Daryl said it very well, uh, seeing the similarities between our cultures and, um, how significant uh, those things can be. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it was a privilege to be part of this conversation today. Thank you for inviting us into your space and sharing so much, um, and getting this conversation started. Um, I want to uh, recognize that this conversation is airing on June 21st, which means we have just wrapped up the first week of Carousel of the Nations, and that means that there's still one more to go this year. So please, um, if you're joining us today, uh, check out the website, carouselofnations.com. Uh, there's still opportunities to participate in the upcoming week. Um, I want to thank Carousel of the Nations and the Multicultural Council of Windsor-Essex uh, for this opportunity today. Uh, Heritage Canada, who also supported this project and made it possible. Thank you to each and every one of you, uh, the youth reps at the table here who uh, really did drive this conversation. I hope that um, it was a good experience uh, for all of you. Um, Everyone who's joining the conversation online, thank you. Uh, so important to have this conversation. And again, as we wrap up, thank you so much, uh, Daryl, Kaylee, and Anella for sharing so much of yourselves with us today and your culture. Uh, it was absolutely my pleasure. And just to uh, comment on what, something that was mentioned in the uh, chat, uh, when we do open up our Three Fires restaurant, uh, Kaylee and I are hoping that that's going to be where our um, hoping next year we can do this live. That will be where Caldwell's Village is next year, ideally, and you will all get to taste some amazing, amazing Indigenous cooked food. Uh, Kaylee's husband, Billy Alexander, happens to be our chef, and the man is uh, unreal with what he can make. Um, 
it's it, the food is mouth watering. Even just seeing pictures of his food makes you want to go, well, rob his house. Um, so uh, it's it's amazing, and I can't wait. Hopefully, uh, as soon as Carousel is able to go in person, we're all we're all going to be able to uh, eat some wonderful food at our new restaurant, and we'll be able to celebrate a little bit more about multiculturalism there. That sounds phenomenal, and I am looking so forward to that. Looking forward to celebrating Carousel in person um, with everyone next year. But uh, while we can't and we are celebrating Carousel at home again this year, thank you for making it possible and helping make meaningful connections to keep the spirit of Carousel going. Cheers, everyone.